Hello, welcome to Book Bites, presented by the Wisconsin Historical Society Press. I'm Scott Spoolman, and this evening we'll take a look at my book, Wisconsin State Parks, Extraordinary Stories of Geology and Natural History. And uh, <clears throat> we'll go on a virtual hike uh, through one of the parks, Interstate State Park, in fact, and we'll use my book as a guide. And then uh, feel free to, to submit questions via the, uh, the Facebook uh, uh, comment section, and uh, I'll try to answer those after I'm done with my presentation here. Wisconsin has a fabulous array of state parks and state forests that draw uh, millions of visitors every year. And for me, when I go to a state park or a, a, such a beautiful, other such beautiful places, what drives me is the desire to know them better, to, to understand how they came to be. Uh, so one thing that caught my eye, uh, this map produced by the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey, uh, it does a very good job of showing the variety of landscapes in the, in the state. And, uh, I thought that by going to the parks, uh, I, I realized that by, if you wanted to zoom in on any one of the areas in the state that, and explore, uh, you could use this wonderful state parks and state forests as entry points. And so I decided that uh, I could think of the state parks and, and forests as gateways to the ancient past, time portals, if you will. And uh, that idea intrigued me. So I decided to go to the parks, learn and explore, explore and learn their stories, and then tell them in a book. And then that way I could share the, the, my fascination with geology and natural history in our state. So that's what I did. Uh, and in writing this book, I would hope to provide a guide that might, you might use to understand and enjoy the, our wonderful state parks. A little later, as I said, I'll walk us through one of the park stories. But first, I wanted to mention that I wanted to talk a little bit about the introductory chapter, which tells the bigger geologic story of the Wisconsin region. Uh, it gives an overview and provides some basic uh, co key concepts to help you fully appreciate the park stories. And the first of those key concepts is the immense time scale covered in the book. I ask you to take yourselves out of our daily time frame that we divide into hours and minutes and seconds and to shift into the much larger frame that we measure in centuries and millennia and millions and billions of years. We'll just briefly look at five periods of time here uh, just to set the stage. Uh, <clears throat> the first is the uh, four billion year Precambrian uh, age, that's 4 billion out of the Earth's total 4.6 billion year history. And during that time, continents were colliding to form the ancient continents, including North America. And within Wisconsin, in the area that would become Wisconsin, uh, mountains were being built. Uh, the next uh, period to focus on was the Cambrian period, a 50 million year uh, period in which ancient seas invaded our area. And a life began to emerge in those seas. During the third period, roughly next 135 million years, uh, came more invasions of seas and accelerating evolution of, of sea creatures and plants. And fourth, during the next roughly 400 million years, the last of the seas had departed and erosion took over and wiped out the fossil record for all of that time. So for example, we don't know uh, if dinosaurs ever roamed in Wisconsin during the famous Jurassic period, they probably did, but we don't have a record of them here because of the fossil record is gone thanks to erosion. And finally, uh, the, the Quaternary period, the two and a half million year ice age, the time of the glaciers, and that within the last 200,000 years of that span, modern humans emerged. Now, the next uh, basic idea uh, to understand is uh, that will help with understanding the park stories is the fact that for much of its history, the Wisconsin region was tropical. Um, I want to thank the UW Press for the use of this image, uh, which David Michelson and his co authors uh, used in producing their great book, Geology of the Ice Age National Scenic Trail. 
Uh, early in its history, the, Earth, the Earth's crust was fractured into several large pieces called plates. And they were jostled and moved around on the planet, driven by the intense heat of the Earth's interior. And this movement of crustal plates is called plate tectonics. Now, the plate on which Wisconsin rode, the North American plate, in pre-Cambrian time, was south of the equator. And due to plate tectonics, it moved in kind of a curly Q fashion like this, uh, tracing a path and then heading north, crossing the equator about 350 million years ago, and continued to shift and move and landed in its current position about 10 million years ago. And we're still, we're still moving, by the way. We're shifting roughly southwest, about as fast as our fingernails are growing. Not fast. And beyond chapter one, uh, the book is organized geographically among five regions with a chapter for each region. And I picked uh, for each region the best, uh, the, the five or six parks that best uh, represent the dynamic processes that occurred there. So for example, in the northwest corridor of the state, um, the uh, the ground the, the bedrock is largely uh, bedrock. <laughs> the bedrock is largely volcanic. Uh, that's Brownstone Falls at Copper Falls State Park, uh, and that's uh, volcanic rock all around and under those falls. In the northeast quarter of the state are parks that lie on very hard rock, such as the quartzite at uh, Rib Mountain State Park near Wausau. And east of there in Door County are five state parks lying on dolomite, another hard rock formed from the sediments of ancient sea plants and animals. It forms features such as these cave, uh, cliffs that make Door County famous. Uh, this one at Peninsula State Park. And in the rolling countryside of southeastern Wisconsin, the glaciers molded the landforms, uh, such as this cone-shaped hill or cane uh, at, at, called Dundee Mountain in, in the Kettle Moraine State Forest. And in the south central part of the state, uh, several processes shaped the landforms, some of them related to the glacier. Uh, for example, even during glacial times, water would flow during the short summers into cracks and crevices in rock. And then during those long cold uh, glacial winters, that water would freeze, expand the cracks and crevices, and eventually pry rock pieces apart one from another. And this process, uh, uh, this freeze-thaw cycle with its pickaxe pick effect uh, over the centuries literally sculpted rock features such as the balanced rock at Devil's Lake State Park. And finally, in the southwest corner of the state, the driftless area, never invaded by glaciers, the slow, steady process of erosion formed features such as Eni Point at Governor Dodge State Park near Dodgeville. Uh, this is a sandstone mass sculpted by wind and water erosion, uninterrupted for hundreds of millions of years. And the young man in the photo there, by the way, is my son, Will. He was helping me that day. Now, each park story has an introduction with more, uh, with more details on geology and natural history. In many cases, I also include some early human history, explaining how Native Americans lived in the park areas and why they too thought of them as special or even sacred. For example, this is Trempolo Mountain up at Perot State Park on the Mississippi River. It's long been sacred ground to the Ho-Chunk uh, long before uh, Europe, uh, who lived here long before Europeans immigrated. Each story includes photos like some of those you're seeing here, and I took just about all of them, um, with uh, one or more trail guides for each park that I wrote after hiking the trails. They, they help you understand what you're going to be seeing as you hike along the trails. And the idea is that with this book, you can hit the trail and play geologist. So let's do that now. Let's go on a hike through Interstate Park in the northwest part of the state. 
It's the first of Wisconsin's state parks, a joint venture with the state of Minnesota established in 1900. And the following paragraph from chapter two in my book sets the stage. The Northwest corner of Wisconsin was shaped by unimaginable forces of extreme heat and cold, heat so intense that it melted rock deep in the earth, forced it to the surface and forged massive new layers of rock, thousands of feet thick over much of the area and cold so intense that it defied the sun captured and froze the earth's water for centuries and built a crushing deep field of ice that spread over most of the state. The interactions of these great masses of rock and ice were largely what created the fascinating landscape of Northwestern Wisconsin. Now, chapter two is called the, the Rift Zone because a little over 1100 million years ago or 1.1 billion years ago, a great plume of magma or hot fluid rock rose up from deep in the earth toward the crust and pried open this long arc, uh, ar uh, arcing crevice in the earth's crust. Uh, it stretched from what is now Southern Michigan, actually below Southern Michigan, angled Northwest and arced through what would become the Lake Superior Basin, then down through Wisconsin, right through the Interstate Park area, which is here, and all the way down into Kansas. Now this great rift might have split our continent in two, uh, but something happened to stop it. We don't really know what. It would, could have been a continental collision uh, to the Southeast somewhere that pushed everything back together, but it's not, not exactly known. At any rate, this rifting process helped to make the area what it is now, because over a period of 25 million years, lava spurted from, these, from this rift and spread out in a wide area all across, all along the rift in an area that included state interstate park, which I, as I said, is right about there. And that lava became basalt, a fine grained, dark colored, very dense rock that underlies northwestern most Wisconsin. Over those millions of years, multiple flows of this lava built up to make a, a mass of basaltic rock that was up to 20,000 feet or close to four miles thick in some areas. Well, uh, the next major process that affected the interstate uh, park area was the coming of Cambrian seas. During the Cambrian period, at least a couple of shallow seas advanced and retreated in the Wisconsin region. Uh, they might have uh, resembled this mudflat area on the east coast of the United States today. Now remember the area that would become Wisconsin was lying close to the equator uh, and was something like a tropical desert. Uh, untold quantities of sand eroded from old desert mountains to the north were carried by streams to the advancing seashores and deposited there, accumulating for millions of years and eventually becoming layers of sandstone totaling thousands of feet thick. And here's an example of Cambrian sandstone from uh, Governor Dodge State Park. After the Cambrian period came inland, came more inland seas uh, that deposited more sandstone, but also life in those oceans was evolving rapidly and becoming more diverse. Uh, in Silurian time, around 400 million years ago, a seafloor probably looked something like this, just teeming with life. Um, this is a, a diorama on display in the Milwaukee Public Museum, showing one of the planet's earliest coral reefs right here in Wisconsin. Seafloor life included shelled animals, such as clinging brachiopods and crawling trilobites. These tall flower-like things called crinoids or sea lilies are actually animals and they feed on or fed on what, whatever was floating by. The chief predator in this system was this giant uh, octopus type critter called a cephalopod. Some of these guys got very large up to 30 feet long. And the remains of such creatures collected on the sea floor for th about 300 million years or so and eventually became limestone which then was converted by chemical reactions to dolomite, 
which is a harder, more erosion resistant cousin to limestone. All of Wisconsin was once covered uh, by dolomite in layers up to 600 feet thick in some areas. Most of it has been eroded away, uh, exposing the older, deeper sandstones in many areas, including the interstate park area. And eventually forests covered the land and before the glaciers came, uh, the area around Interstate Park was a rolling forested plain lying on sandstone. Uh, probably resembling this scene, although this is actually a photo of the Wisconsin River Valley taken from uh, Wyalusing State Park. Well, then along came the glaciers and there were several glaciers during the roughly two and a half million year ice age. Some geologists think that as many as 15 major ice sheets crept down out of Canada. Uh, the most recent one is called the Wisconsin glaciation because our state contains some of the best examples in the world of how a glacier can change the land. Uh, it entered the state around 30,000 years ago and at its peak, the ice over the interstate park area, which is right about here, was probably well over a thousand feet thick. And it might have looked something like this present day glacier in Greenland as it advanced across the state. Eventually, the climate warmed again and the, the glacier began to melt. It retreated in fits and starts and finally melted out of the northernmost part of Wisconsin between 11,000 and 9,500 years ago. Now, when glaciers melt away, the melt waters form lakes called glacial lakes in low-lying areas. Huge glacial lakes can form against the retreating wall of ice and sit for thousands of years. One such lake was Glacial Lake Duluth, which occupied various portions of today's Lake Superior Basin uh, for centuries. At its southern end was a dam made of ice, mostly ice, but it included some sand and gravel from the, from the glacier. It, it was located about 100 miles northeast of the interstate park area, which is down here. With the climate warming and the ice melting, that, day, that dam's days were numbered. Um, and when the rising glacial lake waters finally overwhelmed the dam, the resulting flood was a catastrophic force of nature. Icy meltwater just roared down through this valley of the ancient St. Croix River. And my book uh, explains that when the flood from the glacial lake arrived, it probably engulfed all of what is now Interstate Park. It might have resembled this glacial meltwater flooding that's happening today in Iceland. It tore away the much softer sandstone overlying the basalt bedrock and then began chiseling uh, that harder underlying bedrock. By digging and chiseling in this way, uh, the icy blast of water bored out this deep, narrow gorge piece by piece. And it probably took a few hundred years, but in geologic time, that's very quick. <laughs> um, and this was the result. This is what I mean by going back in time in the state parks. This little canyon at Interstate Park called the Dalles of the St. Croix was carved by the post-glacial flood. You can get this stunning view of the Dalles of the St. Croix by hiking a trail called the Potholes Trail. Uh, now on the same trail, of course, you can see some of Interstate Park's famous potholes. Um, this one is about five feet across at the top and goes down about eight or nine feet. It was formed by gravel and rocks that got caught in an eddy of the massive flood and were whirled ferociously against the bedrock for decades or centuries until this hole had literally been drilled into that hard, hard rock. And there are many, many of these potholes at Interstate Park, some of them much bigger than this one. Uh, my Minnesota friends will tell you that the Minnesota side of the park has the far bigger potholes. <laughs> uh, at this point on the potholes trail, you are about a hundred feet above the river. 
And this is how we know that the post-glacial flood must have spread across the entire park area for centuries, uh, drilling holes here and there while it excavated that gorge. When Lake Duluth had finally drained to a certain point, uh, the, the river level also dropped, leaving the potholes on this trail high over the river. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, from another trail uh, called the River Bluff Trail, you can look across the St. Croix River to the Minnesota side for a good view of one of the walls of the gorge and the massive basalt that was built over a 25 million year period. This is uh, just, a, just the top 100 feet or so of a massive basalt that's probably thousands of feet thick. You can see how the basalt uh, on this wall fractured into blocks defined by vertical and horizontal cracks. That's the way it, that's the way it fractures and that's how the gorge was eroded. Uh, and, and can you see the, the climbers in this photo? You see, here's one here going straight up the middle. Here's one over here angling up to the left. Uh, these people are working their way up this rock face uh, using cracks and crags that were formed long before humans existed on the planet, and let alone before any of them decided it was a good idea to climb up rock walls like these. Uh, rock climbers love this kind of rock. Uh, well, we've come to the end of our hike through Interstate Park. Uh, this is one of several pine groves that you can visit in the park. After the last glacier retreated, as you no doubt know, great pine forests eventually covered most of Wisconsin and stood for thousands of years. Since they were logged by the early 20th century, the forest in the park area has reclaimed the land. And some nice stands of white and red pine can give you a sense of that ancient forest. I'll leave you with the following paragraph, which reflects one of my most memorable experiences hiking in all the parks. It's from the Interstate Story. What covers much of Interstate Park now is second and third growth forests that have their own remarkable beauty, if not the majesty of the ancient pine forest. Nevertheless, when you are hiking on one of the many trails in the park that pass through small groves of white or red pine, stop for a moment and close your eyes. Smell the scented air and listen for the delicate song of the wind in the pines. You might then imagine yourself to be in that vast deep forest that once stood here on top of gravel and soil dropped by the glacier, on top of sandstone and limestone deposited by ancient seas, on top of volcanic bedrock laid down a billion years ago. Well, it's been a pleasure presenting to you. Sorry about the technical difficulties. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did as soon as we finally got going. Uh, if you'd like to get a copy of the book, I suggest uh, going to shop at, going to shop.wisconsinhistory.org. Um, that's the Historical Society site. Well, I also have a Facebook page which has the same title as, as the book title. So that's all. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>